So the last slide says that a new era in, in, in healing is open to all of us. The plant-based wave is breaking. Line up your surfboard and start your own era of health and healing with your very next whole food plant-based diet. Now, uh, these are the resources that you should take advantage of. And these are the major mechanisms uh, of, uh, of disease reversal utilizing plant-based nutrition. What changes when you go from an animal-based diet to a plant-based diet? Everything changes, and we should take advantage of that. Uh, okay, so with that, I will stop my share, and uh, we have a few minutes left over for questions. Uh, yeah. A lot of information, but hopefully it's been useful. Yeah, tremendous amount of information. Thank you for sharing all of that with us. Always a, a pleasure to uh, to watch you present all this information in, in a very digestible way. So, um, so real quickly, so you you showed on your last slide how people can get in touch with you, doctor uh, drclapper.com. Um, and then uh, your books are available on, uh, you know, through the bookstore. Any purchases will be through Amazon, but but uh, the real truth about health will get a, a little uh, a little bit to help us fund the great work that we're doing here. Um, so we're going to begin the Q and A. Uh, I'm going to try to get to audience also, but we just have a you know very few minute, you know, very uh, limited amount of time. So real quickly, given the 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 current paradigm for medicine and how people make their money, how specifically doctors, how, like what financial incentive, and not even a financial incentive, like they're gonna, you know, but but how could they sustain their lifestyles to be quite honest, right? You know, right now doctors are extremely well paid. There are many doctors making over a half million dollars a year. And they're, you know, they're making it in, you know, through dealing with insurance companies that fund certain things and not others. How is it possible that a, that a doctor who wants to do this stuff but has built himself a lifestyle based on, on you know, doing procedures and, and prescribing medications can move over to this without harming themselves financially. Oh my, uh, and you know, that is the $64 question, uh, $64 million question. Uh, and uh, and it's the, the, the nut of the problem we're facing here. It's, it's not going to be easy. It could be easy. Um, again, the, if the insurance companies were really interested in helping their patients heal instead of making money off every bypass and every stent and every uh, prescription written, um, they would see that they would, they would hold on to more of their money by truly getting their patients healthier. And um, because there's there's money to be made in keeping people healthy. For every CEO of a company that doesn't go down with a heart attack or a stroke, their employees continue earning paychecks, paying taxes to the community. Uh, there, there's benefits to keeping people healthy, uh, but that needs to be incorporated into the insurance reimbursement. Um, we're at a time of transformation. Um, what happened to the whale harpooners when whaling was uh, uh, was outlawed? What happened to the buggy whip makers when automobiles came in? They they wound up doing something else. They had to change. They saw that era has passed. Now you're asking, how can a practicing cardiologist um, uh, go plant based here uh, and still make money? There's probably going to be a dip of an income, but they're going to get more patients. And most of the money is made from that initial assessment and the test ordering, et cetera. And uh, this happened to uh, 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 head of cardiology at Rus Presbyterian. Uh, they got their patients on a whole food plant-based diet. They started seeing fewer patients because their patients were getting healthier, but they had opened up spaces in their schedule to allow more patients to come in. And they actually made their, most of their money on the initial assessment and, and prescriptions uh, and, uh, and treatments that were prescribed. So it can be done. The insurance companies need to, to change their reimbursement models and reward the doctor and the patients with lower rates uh, for keeping themselves healthy. It could be done, but it's going to take lots of work uh, and that's why I want to gather the the, uh, the statistics up in Canada and bring them to the U.S. and give those lectures saying this is doable and everybody wins. The doctor and the patient will win with this evolution. It's not going to be easy or just a couple of oxes are going to get gored here for a non-vegan analogy. But it's we have to do that. The present model is leading us to death and bankruptcy. We've got to change it and it can be done. So uh, that's what we're trying to do. So last year we spoke about um, Dr. Furman's assessment that uh, he's seeing uh, many vegans come in with uh, with 
dementia, you know, long-term vegans. So, and, and um, one of the things that he thinks that people should be on is uh, um, DHA EPA. And I know that you had mentioned that for a long time you were reluctant on it, but he eventually convinced you to take that. How have you found, well, what are your thoughts on he, what he is seeing in his patient population and how have you found supplementing uh, DHA and EPA, realizing that's just an N of one, but um, how have you found that? Has that been you know meaningful to you? Have you noticed a difference? Is it worth uh, people who are listening? Is it worth them taking such a supplement? Oh boy, this is not going to be a very satisfying answer. Um, I am far from settled on this question. Uh, I have, uh, my experience has been different than Dr. Furman's. I've not seen lots of vegans, any vegans with dementia. I'm not saying they can't happen, but a lot it depends on what these people ate in their diet before they became vegan. If, if they were ate the standard Western diets labor 70 and changed to a vegan diet, then the damage has already been done. Uh, it's very hard to, uh, to extrapolate from uh, a handful of patients. Um, my omega-3 index is very low, um, so I reluctantly started on it, but I am highly dubious that one, it's having any effect at all, uh, and there's going to be more literature showing up that the body makes it all the DHA it needs if you give it the, uh, the omega-3 uh, linolenic acid in the walnuts and the flax seeds and the hemp seeds, et cetera, the body to make all the, the DHA that you really need. So I am still on the fence here and I'm leaning more towards stop taking the stuff, uh, but I'm going to be following the literature uh, about this very issue here, but I'm getting to be more and more skeptical that it really makes much of a difference at all. And I take it a few times a week, uh, a bit of a Hail Mary, but uh, again, I need to be convinced. Um, now, there are some semi-convincing studies, as Dr. Furman, Dr. Khan will point out about this dementia issue. So I'm reluctantly taking it, but I'm, I'm with a moderate amount of skepticism at this point. So stay tuned. When I get to a definitive decision, I'll make another video. But right now, I'm still taking this stuff, but I'm, I'm skeptical. Okay. Well, I appreciate your honesty on that. that. Um, and um, so on the same topic of supplementation, um, what are your thoughts on things that people should should consider, you know, based on the uh, the studies that you've seen, such as obviously B12, I think is is pretty well settled. Um, I think I mean, T. Con Campbell is not a big fan of B12, but I think his his wife forces him to take it, as, as, as if I recall our conversation correctly. But the um, but D is extremely popular. Um, are, are there any, you know, what are your thoughts on supplementation as, on a whole food plant-based diet? And is there anything that, you, that where the science is just really conclusive and is there anything that you want to hedge your bets on and, and you, you would suggest people take, even though the science is not as clear? Uh, B12 and D, uh, but even Dr. McDougall says vitamin D makes, uh, is, uh, actually uh, creates adverse effects. Uh, everyone is, is hesitant to be taking the, these supplements, and, and rightly so. No other animal, no gorilla takes vitamin D supplements. Uh, they're living natural lives. Um, uh, but I do take uh, the B12 and, and the D. Uh, the only other ones of concern is iodine, which we need for our thyroid gland. Uh, if you're not, eat, we're not eating fish. So if you're not eating sea vegetables on a regular basis, uh, I would say, um, which you should, a few times a week, we throw a gob of of arame or wakame into a soup or a salad. Uh, but we, but I use very little salt, but a pinch of iodized salt probably makes some sense. But in the multivitamin I take, there is 150 micrograms of iodine. So, uh, so cover your iodine needs. This should do it, um, but in most of these multivitamins, there's uh, uh, a little bit of zinc, and that's probably a good thing for most vegans. Zinc can be a little problematic unless you're eating a really substantial amount of legumes, which you should be every day. So the zinc and the iodine are the other, the other two that if you're going to be taking a, a vegan multivitamin, make sure they've got a significant amount of uh, iodine and zinc. Those are about the only two that I would uh, add to that list. All right, I'm going to throw a question out to the audience. So, um, Kevin, if you can unmute yourself, state where you're from and ask your question. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, uh, hi, Dr. Clapper. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Very well. Okay. So, um, is there any adjustment on uh, your dietary recommendations for recovering alcoholics or people with uh, both alcoholic and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? 
Uh, well, the whole food plant-based diet is the definitive treatment for uh, fatty liver disease. One, obviously, the ethyl alcohol should never pass through the liver again. And the liver is the champion organ in the body for healing itself, but you got to give it a break. So zero alcohol uh, ever again. And because of the, the venous system, the system of veins in the body that are wrapped around the intestine, they all come together to form the portal vein that goes right up into the liver. So everything you eat goes right up into the liver and bathes the liver cells with all the whatever was in the meal. And the beauty of the salads and the soups and the steamed veggies, they're full of these phytonutrients that flow through the liver and heal them. And so, uh, so we can talk about some supplements, but the most important way to heal a liver is yank out the alcohol and the junk sugars that, that turn into uric acid, et cetera, the high fructose corn syrup, all that stuff, stop that. Uh, and the whole food plant-based diet and tincture of time uh, will allow that liver to heal. I've seen stunningly damaged livers uh, repair themselves with a whole food plant-based diet. Thank you. So we're, we're, sugar is extremely vilified as being like the worst thing. And then also by, by uh, um, the transitive property carbohydrates, what actually puts fat on our body? Is it sugar or is it fat? Uh, it, it, it's, it's the combination of both. There's some call oxidative priority. When you eat fat and sugar at the same time, because it's easier to burn the sugar, uh, the body thinks, hmm, fat, sugar in the blood. Let me burn that sugar now. I'll store that fat for later. So when you pour oil on your pasta, you're creating that fat-sugar combination. Most baked goods are fat and sugar. The, the flour is the sugar, and there's some fat, some shortening egg yolks holding that that. that <laughs> sugar together. So it's the fat sugar combination that sticks to folks. It's the baked goods, it's the flour products, uh, and the added oils and, and fats that cause the problem. Now, your body can handle small amounts of natural sugars in the whole foods. They can handle small amounts of the whole fats that are in the walnuts and flax seeds, etc. But get your fats out of whole foods, not out of glass bottles. That's why we're uh, not big fans of oils here. So uh, it's not a matter of what's bad, fat or sugar. We need them both, but they should come from whole plant foods. If you're eating whole plant foods, obesity really isn't an issue for those kind of folks. And um, what are your thoughts on, so for people, you know, most people are not on a whole food plant-based diet right? That's, that's the reality of the situation. Um, when they get high blood pressure or they get cholesterol, they're, they're thrown medications. Do those medications actually address their likelihood of dying from, from these ailments and, and their, and their health conditions as a whole? Um, or are they just masking a, a benchmark, uh, of, you know, or a symptom of a you know, larger metabolic issue? Uh, the answer is in your question, of course, and uh, most cardiologists, they don't talk about it, but the fact is, um, despite these huge amounts of statins, the, the amount of actual cardiac death uh, has not has only decreased by that much. They, they, for pounding down that cholesterol, we have not seen a dramatic reduction because that isn't really the problem. The issue isn't how high is your cholesterol. The question is how healthy are your artery walls? How have you been treating them? Are they inflamed and developing plaque or aren't they? If you're eating rice and beans and greens and fruits and vegetables, there's no reason that you should be developing plaque on the inside of your arteries. And just using these drugs to pound down your liver's ability to make cholesterol or to crank those arteries open can have some benefit, but they are not getting to the root of the problem. It's the food. It's been the food all along. And uh, that's where we really have to put our focus. And if you're, if someone's eating a whole food plant-based diet and they're doing everything right, according to, uh, to your uh, protocol, and they still have cholesterol at say 200, is that something they should worry about and take medication for? Or, is it just, you know, the, if all the other indications seem okay, but the cholesterol is just at 200. Is that just the way it is? Uh, it might be just the way it is. I tell people if they go to my video Beyond Cholesterol on my website, uh, well, we talk about this very issue there. And, and again, the... Um, 
I tell people, if you're not eating anybody else's cholesterol, trust your liver. It knows how much cholesterol to keep in your bloodstream. But get your inflammatory markers checked. And I list them there, the high uh, HSCRP and myeloproxides, et cetera. And get a scan of your carotid arteries. If your inflammatory markers are negative and your carotid arteries are healthy and, and no plaque, you don't have the disease, even though your cholesterol may be 200. So again, it's how every meal is treating your arteries walls there. So um, now, now I've got a couple of vegans with clogged arteries, but they're, they've they been eating flour products and vegan junk foods, and those will hurt you. Um, so, But if the diet is basically just whole foods um, uh, uh, from the garden, um, there's no reason you should be developing plaque in your arteries. So uh, it's a rare thing to happen. So again, the question is not how high is your cholesterol, it's how healthy your arteries. Be nice to your arteries. They'll be nice to you. Perfect. And unfortunately, we've run out of time. So um, I want to thank you for all the information that you shared today. If we can unmute the audience so they can share their appreciation.